Good evening and welcome to the Harvard Art Museums and to tonight's lecture, Louisiana Medley, the social justice photography of Chandra McCormick and Keith Calhoun. My name is Natalie Gale and I am a junior living in Dunster House and I concentrate in history and literature and art, film and visual studies. And my name is Ava Hampton. I'm a junior living in Courier House and I concentrate in history and literature. Natalie and I are members of the Harvard Art Museum Student Board and are delighted to welcome you to the museums on behalf of our student community. Please now be sure to turn off your cell phones and help me to warmly welcome So Young Lee, the Landon and Lavinia Chief Curator at the Harvard Art Museums, who will introduce tonight's program. Thank you, Natalie and Ava, for that warm welcome. We're very fortunate to have a slew of extremely talented young leaders on our student board, and it's one of the very special things about the Harvard Art Museums. So welcome, and thank you for joining me, for joining us um, at tonight's event. My name is So Young Lee, as introduced. I'm the Landon and Lavinia Clay Chief Curator here at the Harvard Art Museums. And it's my great pleasure and privilege to introduce our speakers tonight, Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick. So a little bit about our special guests. Um, but first, tonight's program is presented in conjunction with our current exhibition, Homer, uh, Winslow Homer, Eyewitness, which was curated by Ethan Lasser, who I think should be in this room. Ethan, are you here? Who was our American, there he is. Until very recently, our American art curator and head of the Division of European and American Art, and now across the river at the MFA, um, along with Makita Best, the Richard L. Menschel Curator of Photography. And the exhibition traces how Winsler <clears throat> Homer's time as a Civil War correspondent um, for the illustrated periodical um, Harper's Weekly really shaped his later career as a painter, um, and watercolor. So it kind of tells a new story on a familiar, very familiar figure. Now central to this exhibit, exhibition is the critical importance of bearing witness and the particular power of photography um, to provide visual testimony to a lived experience. Those are both themes that are central to the work of our speakers, um, tonight's speakers. Keith Calhoun and Chandra McCormick, who were born and raised in the Lower Ninth Ward of New Orleans, Louisiana. A husband and wife team and artistic collaborators, they've been documenting Louisiana and its people for over 25 years. Pursuing social activism through photography, Calhoun and McCormick have documented the soul of New Orleans in a vanishing Louisiana. So, um, the last of the sugarcane workers, the dock workers, the sweet potato harvesters, the displaced African Americans after Katrina. They photographed the traditions of black church services, of community rites and celebrations, such as parades um, and jazz funerals, and the cruel conditions of the Louisiana State um, Pen Penitentiary at Angola a former slave breeding plantation named for the African nation from which, and I quote, the most profitable slaves, according to slave owners, were kidnapped. Importantly, their work prompts us to reflect on the legacies of slavery in the American South today, and really throughout America. Considering how economic and social system of disenfranchisement continue to be visible and can be made visible through photography. Their work has been featured in numerous exhibitions across the country and most recently selected for the La Biennale di Venezia's 56th International Exhibition in Photography. And I'm very pleased to share that very soon uh, we will be acquiring a, one of their works for the Harvard Art Museum's collection, thanks to the work of Makita. 
Now, this question of tracing the legacies of slavery in the US has also been an essential part of the scholarship of Professor John Stouffer, the Sumner R. and Marshall S. Cates Professor of English and of African and African American Studies here at Harvard, who is sitting right here in the front, who will join our speakers um, in a conversation along with our very own Makita Best, again, curator of photography. Professor Stouffer is the author or editor of 20 books and over 100 articles, which mostly focus on anti-slavery, social protest, or photography. His books, including Giants, The Parallel Lives of Frederick Douglass and Abram Lincoln, The Black Hearts of Men and Frederick Douglass, have received national acclaim and numerous awards. His essays and reviews, too numerous to mention each one here, have appeared in Time, The Washington Journal, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Huffington Post, and in scholarly journals and books as well. We're delighted and extremely grateful that uh, Professor Stouffer is a regular here at the Harvard Art Museums, um, and he's actively engaging his students through object-based study, um, teaching in our galleries and in our art study seminar rooms, um, and using the uh, university teaching gallery as well, so thank you. Now, before I welcome our speakers onto the stage, a few words of thanks are in order. The support for tonight's program is provided by the Richard L. Menschel Fund, I'm sorry, Endowment Fund at the Harvard Art Museums, and we're enormously grateful um, that this fund allows us regularly to incorporate programs on photography. And in addition, support for the Winslow Homer exhibition was provided by the Bolton Fund for American Art, a gift of the Payne Fund, and the Henry Luce Foundation Fund for the American Art Department. We deeply appreciate their gener generosity in helping realize this important exhibition. And you will all have the opportunity to visit the show after the program ends, as the gallery will remain open until 8 o'clock. And I strongly urge you, those of you who've already seen the show as well, um, to pop into the gallery. Finally, tonight's lecture is co-sponsored by the Neiman Foundation for Journalism here at Harvard, the Department of History of Art and Architecture, and the Department of Art, Film, and Visual Studies. A sincere thanks to all those partners um, and collaborators for their vital support. So without further ado, please join me in welcoming Chandra McCormick and Keith Calhoun. New Orleans was a, a walking city, a, a city where people were out, just like New city. York. And you see somebody 24-7 walking wherever. Well, New Orleans was that kind of town, yeah, too. Yeah. You go to certain areas where you knew it flourished with people, and there was life. It's like dead. I, I don't know what they're trying to do here, but they're killing it. Yeah, the they, they cannot kill the culture, though. That is one thing that will never, ever die in this city. A lot of our work was inundated by the floodwaters of Hurricane Katrina. You know, in the beginning, we were really literally throwing the stuff away because all we saw was big bins of this nasty water. And so the ones that we kept, we put in a, a freezer. Um, we just thought that that would stop the deterioration of whatever was happening, and so, when we 
started working with them. I can't even explain like what happened, but the transformation of the slides and the negatives are just beautiful. You know, when you hear about the night ward, oh, you hear about oh, the poor people in the night ward. You know, they're poor people, but the poor night ward was 98% homeowners. If you so, know who Fat was? Fat's Domino. You guys are old enough to know Fat. But Fat House is right in the next block. He never left the night ward. He could have lived anywhere in the world, but Fat stood all the way through Katrina in his house. I mean, it wasn't meant for the poor people to come back. But once the people got out, they say keep them out. So then the city up for grabs. So all these new folk coming in, half of them don't even live here. They just buying. Every day you get a they new letter. Do you want to sell things. your house? That's so it. a lot of older people, especially in the black community, they never had succession. The houses were still in grandma name. When I photographed the night ward 40 years ago, I had no idea that it would be all empty lots and things like that. So you see the importance of of a photograph now. I just think that me and Chandra, we was fortunate to be able to come back and uh, claim a space in our community and have a, 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 a viable, comfortable space to work from, you know? And uh, that's a blessing, you know? Yeah. yeah, we more involved in our work. Gonna always be part of this community, you know? You know, our work comes from the people, so it, to me it belongs to the people, it's for the people. They have certain people wants to be a authority on, on our culture, and, and, and we have to be able to speak. That's why I'm teaching young kids in the neighborhood to, to be able to go out. You know, photography can take you through any door, like I tell a camera, a camera more powerful than AK-47, you know, than in the right hands, it's a weapon. Thank you all for joining us this evening. Thank you, Chandra and Keith and John. Um, it was really fascinating to you know, watch this, this clip and, and to see you going through or reflecting on your kind of career your career and in the work that you produced together, but perhaps you could take us back to when you first started making photographs, Keith, I know you had come from Los Angeles and, and how you met Chandra and, and started this kind of body of work together. Okay, going way back, but I can tell y'all. Um, at a young age, um, I was fortunate to go live with my sister in New Orleans, I mean in Los Angeles, and when I got there, she would tell me, you gotta get out and see things. So she would bring me to the LA County Museum. And for the first two or three weeks, I never went in, I'll tell you now, because I, I couldn't feel it. I wasn't used to going to no museum and I didn't wanna go in the museum. But anyway, by me going to that museum, I finally went in, because every time I would go, she would ask me a million questions. So I didn't have none, so I said, I better go in. So one, when I did go in, they had a, uh, that was doing when black films were coming out. It was a lot of exploitation films and things. So I met this lady who happened to be a producer at a local um, educational station called KCT, Los Angeles. And I told her I was from New Orleans and if you had any work, give me a call. If you, you know. and so a week later, I got a call so through that opportunity, I was allowed to, to go intern at KCET. And through that, she had created a, um, a TV show called Doing It at the Stove Front, which 
we was able to go out in the community and report on things that was going on. And through that time, I was able to get involved in the inner city culture theater. They had a lot of things going on with the arts at that time. You had the Watch Writers Workshop, um, fund the Institute. It was just a lot at that time. So that helped me establish um, contact in the community. I was able to get out and shoot a lot. But after a while in Los Angeles, I decided to return back to New Orleans. And from that time, um, I had set up a studio in New Orleans and, and I was doing a lot of um, commercial work, photography, models and everything. And through that time I met Chandra who wanted some black and white photos. And from that time, I had shot, what, 12, 13 pictures, and I owed her 14 for the, for the presentation. Did I ever get paid? <laughs> but I'm, I'm trying to go back. <laughs> but anyway, when I bought her in the dark room, I said, well, I can, I can go make the print. So when I bought her into the lab, she wanted to see, and we made the print. I can tell she was like fascinated with the process. So she said, well, can I come learn more of this? And I said, sure, because I didn't really care about dark room at that time much. I was more wanting to shoot and just be out shooting. And so she started shooting. And from that, she would tell me, you need to get in closer, you know. You, you know. So then I said, well, why don't you shoot? Which was not too good, because you know, two people with the same habit could be bad, because we buy a film. And then when we started shooting, like I would have a brick of film for the young people, a brick of film to like 20 rows. So when I would get to a procession, I'd be like, what happened to the film? And Chandra's gone way off. So I might have three or four rows to her 10 rows. So when we get back to the lab, because she was running the film. So what I'm trying to say, her practice in the lab helped, it shaped her eye. So she started shooting and then it became addictive for, for us to work together. And we've been doing it ever since. And uh, I think he was actually looking for a printer anyway. <laughs> <laughs> well, you didn't, yeah. You know, printing was like the end game, you know. But I think what Chandra's advantage was is that, and then when she started shooting, I made her take, because I had a different lenses. So she, she wanted to take all the lenses at one time. I said, no, just work with the 50, you know. And, and then, shoot, get into people more closer. And then from that, she started working with the, um, the different lenses, the 35, 24. And I seen her potential. I said, well, you need to work, you know, go work on this thing. And, and from that, you know, I, I was honored because with Chandra, you know, photography is very expensive. And it wasn't really like for poor folk, it was kind of, you know, because back then we was buying a box of silver paper, and every time you burn a sheet, that was like throwing money in the trash, you know? So Shonda got real good at, if at making them test strips, you know? <laughs> so it was, it was like, for me, um, New Orleans is the type of town, if you've never been there, it's a people's town, you know? It's like, it was people always out moving about. So, you know, we can't go wrong because every day there's a picture to be made. So through that, we became involved in our community. We started shooting all the old churches, like going down the river road. We photographed life on the river. And it was like each time we would, uh, but to go back some, the main thing was my father was a dock worker. And that was one of the first series I started documenting the men on the walls because at that time, the containerization was coming in, and there was no need for the labor. Because to New Orleans, the docks was the back for black New Orleans. If, if you worked on the docks, if you worked two days out of a week, you made a, you know, good money. So all my days, I grew up around men going on the docks. So somehow, that was my first essay to go out and shoot the beauty of them men toting them big bales of sacks. And, loading the cargo into the ship hole. And um, it kind of made people scared of the big, the big stevedore company people. They couldn't believe that I was out there shooting the beauty of the work because they was like, what is this guy out here shooting 
on these docks. You know, I had went to the Port Authority and they give me a letter to say I can go on the docks 24 hours a day. So I had this letter, so when custom run up on me, I show them my letter. And they were like, well, who are you working for? And I said, I'm just shooting them in, you know, and they couldn't. So my father finally came and told me, he said, look, son, whatever you're doing on the docks, finish it up because you got a lot of people in the big office up there talking about what's going on with you on the docks so much. And through that process, me and Shauna, we just began photographing life along the river, you know. Or be some of the images, we can see some of the images. Uh, oh, good, yeah, yeah. Oh, gosh. This That's, is, go ahead, Shonda, you want to? It's sugar cane um, workers. We photographed through Louisiana um, what we call the labor force, and so sugar cane uh, scrappers, yeah. they would catch whatever the one row machine, which had just been invented, um, missed. So the people would scrap the cane. And um, that's what these women here, and that's all ladies in the field, they're scrapping sugar cane. Bessie K Plantation. What we documented was the last working plantations of Louisiana where you still had families, not a lot of them didn't turn into B&B and stuff, but we actually photographed the last working force of, of the people working in the fields. Because we always feel that these people you know, they have a story, and it was interesting for us to catch the burning of the cane. Mm -hmm. And, um, I mean, it was hard work, but we was able to capture it in that moment. Mm -hmm. You want to go to the next one? You want to so, say something? So, um, these, are, these are about eight of the women that we followed. Every time we went to Bessie K, it would be these women, and they would have maybe three men. And one of the men worked the the burning machine and the cane, and the other two men, they did other things. But these women were the ones who worked in the field and cut the cane. This was, oh, go ahead. In the, in the early 80s, um, from probably 1982. Yeah, 82 to 87, 88. This is a woman named Joyce Priestley. Her and uh, two of her sisters and two of her brothers worked in the sugar cane field. She had two children, so she was a mother. So you an adult knew, in this area. you knew these people from uh, New Orleans, or you no, grew up with them? Or? We we actually when we we go along the river road documenting um, the different essays, the churches, the sugar cane workers, all the labor. And so when we meet these people, like, it was a first when I first met Joyce. And we actually become friends. Yeah. We go back and visit them numerous times. We would bring things to them. Mm -hmm. um, well, because you're really, I mean, you created a, a very, an archive, really, of this region. That must have, um, you know, reflecting on that when you were, the, the images that were destroyed during Katrina, I mean, it must have been a very, you know, painful experience to see that you've created so many documents of mm -hmm. this life and and to see what happened to it, but yet to see new works being made out of it. Yeah, so so that that was work before the hurricane and it was actually one of the negatives that was among all the rest of them that um, were waterlogged. Everything um, was not soaking in water, but was wet. Um, we had some bins uh, that had a little water in them. They didn't have a whole lot of things in them, so they might have floated and maybe turned over, but it wasn't as bad. Yeah. So a lot of stuff we, we rewashed as well, like, like for instance, the Joyce Priestley. It was damp, mm -hmm. and it was something that we had to wash over in order to use. And what did you do with these images? So you're making these kind of, um, were, were you giving them to people? Did you? Um, Keith, you said you had a studio. Were you showing them? We were showing them. Yeah. Um, I think. I think that. Um, I'm not sure. Anyway. Um, okay. I. I think that because of the different essays that we work on, um, there's always a theme involved. So. There are different categories of the work, and we showed, you know, we would have exhibitions. People would call us because they knew that we photographed certain things. Um, 
that because of documentary work. There weren't a whole bunch of documentary photographers around, so people would call us for special things to to show in yeah. exhibitions mm -hmm. or um, magazines mm -hmm. that wanted specific type work, you know, like that. Mm -hmm. And we sh we we you know we shared by giving images away by showing them in the community. Mm -hmm. yeah. So each of these and each of these images, you guys would take turns, or how how did you kind of approach well, this practice? Usually, when we go out in the field, Shonda go her way. Even though we work together, but when we get to, it's so much to be documented, when you go on, so like Shonda, she worked with the guy here, and we we would just split up because you know you see so much, like you you your eyes just wondering. So a lot of times we might come there together, but at the end. She's gone off this way and I'm that way. But when we come back to the lab, you know, we'll print. And uh, which I think a lot of that film is mine. Like this one could be mine. But, uh. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like Chandra started this rule now. Where every time we would shoot, she'd take a picture of me to make sure that I didn't claim her shot. We used to have. <laughs> <laughs> you know, people would always say, like, how do y'all do that? Like, y'all yeah. work together. Yeah. And, you know, some, some people work together as a team. Um, they may not be a couple, or they may be a couple, and they actually like share the work. We share the work, but, yeah. but I think I have a style, and he has a style, and so we've always kept the works separate, but together. But you know, identified each person's images, and so I I think that's how it should be. Did I do something? Did I turn it off? Are you messing up? <laughs> I, so oh, it, there it is. Okay. So at this time, people were working in. So you, you can keep going. You can go. yeah. yeah. So people were working in. Um, <laughs> it's okay. not you, it's yeah, so that's a young man named Mark Gill. Um, he was the oldest of ten. And he um, he worked in the field with his family. So people were working in sugarcane. They were working yeah. on farms yeah. and in sugarcane. Go ahead. That was strictly sugarcane. The sugarcane process. Oh, I'm sorry. I was going to say, could you um, speak a little a bit about just? I mean, this is a beautiful. He's close beautiful. In, in oh yeah. It really is. So uh, would you, you would you would you first introduce yourselves and then talk to him and get to know him or your subjects and then mm -hmm. photograph him? How, walk yeah. us through the process <laughs> of achieving this extraordinary so when, photograph. When, when, we, when we actually went to this plantation, um, St. John his, Parish, his, his mother and his father, um, we kind of clicked with, we started talking with those people, all of the people that kind of worked there, we let them know who we were, what we were working on, and asked them about taking pictures, and it was fine. And so once, you know, taking the imagery, if you, are there working with them as they're working, you become invisible. Yeah. So um, even though this is a portrait, and I, I, he was standing there for me to take it, you know, um, I still saw, I thought he looked, he was just this big, beautiful Nubian, black, blue, and strong man, you know, and I just, I wanted to portray him in that way. Yeah, it was important to show the strength because even during slavery, like if you were sold to a sugar plantation, that was the worst thing could happen because it was so brutal. You know, like we interviewed old people uh, with the way the cane would work. Some people at one time they would work the cane workers into the night and they would get their arms amputated just working in the dark. So when we seen these people, like this is the governor's Foster's plantation, a governor of Louisiana. We want to show with the governor at that time, um, what he had in the back of his plantation, and, and this is in Franklin Parish. And if you look at some of the images in the housing, this is what we would call it. at one time, that's like a slave quarter house, but really that's an overseer house, them houses. That's where the overseer would live. But, Did but you, if you see where that was? In Franklin, uh, St. And? The governor. Oh, yeah. yeah. Okay. Like I'm the governor. Like, At that time, it was the governor Foster's plantation. Huh. In rural Louisiana today, you still have a lot of, like now, um, we documenting some of the plantation. And now it's more migrant workers 
working now. You don't see many African Americans no more. Mm. And a lot of them want to go back to their country, so I don't know. But this is Chandra shot here. Um, this is something else. Like I said, we work in, in themes, so as we work um, on the, the uh, I'm sorry, this is my phone. As we worked on the River Roads um, projects, which was uh, the plantation work, well then, it brought us into other things. We, we asked them what churches they went to. Yeah. And we asked them, could we come to church with them? Could we go on Sunday and go to church with them? So this is a lower parish Phoenix. from New Orleans. It's Phoenix, Louisiana. And so they, they did a lot of, they were still doing river baptisms mm -hmm. um, in the river in Louisiana. And so I took a picture of these little girls, which yeah. I thought was beautiful. And this is like showering. Kids do it everywhere, but this is the seventh ward in New Orleans, and I call it cooling out. This is a picture I took out of a blues singer house named Boogie Bill Webb, who lived in the Lower Ninth Ward. As a kid, I grew up around again men who got together every weekend and they cook food and uh, had a first Friday go we go fishing and then come back and fry, but uh, I like the way uh, the movement and the guy with his hand holding the drink there, that's Boogie Bill, you can't see him, but he's on the side. And, and Keith calls this, the way she shakes, she shimmies, makes me want to holler. Yeah. <laughs> oh, okay, sorry. So this is one of Keith's this, images yeah. too. That's Junior's joke junk there. Junior was a bar that sit in the lower ninth ward, right where the levee, out right front there, that's where the water came in in that part of the ninth ward. But uh, it was something about the light that day. I liked the way it was coming through the door and the reflection of the man in the window. But, uh, you know, you know, it's the pretty much New Orleans we grew up around where uh, you had neighborhood bars where guys hung out and shot the breeze, but... Uh, it's been written about and it's been described as having like Caravaggio lighting. And this, this was a, a protest for Corey Harden, who was killed by the New Orleans police. And this is how the old projects look in New Orleans. This is the St. Bernard public housing. It's now called Columbia Court. Yeah. This is one of my favorite pictures of this guy because in New Orleans, uh, you have a lot of social and pleasure clubs and benevolent society. And this man here, it's just the dignity that he had in, in his face and his life. But when I look at his eyebrows, it matched the bow tie to me, you know? <laughs> I mean, I just like photography. But uh, I just like the way his stance was. And this is See Your Loved Ones Penitentiarize Angola. And what's happening there, it's common to see signs because a lot of our young people spend their life yo yo in between New Orleans and Angola prison. So when I seen a sign and a little boy standing because they had buses that pick families and bring them to the prison. So I just wanted to kind of establish that shot. But I like the way the brother's holding hand mm. in, in the sign. Maybe, John, you could tell us a little bit about, for the audience, just tell us about what Angola, like why is this an important topic and what, what, that, what that means. So Angola prison uh, was literally, the, in the antebellum period, the site of a major slave plantation. Uh, and uh, it's the largest uh, prison in the United States uh, today. And there's a long history. In fact, the first period of mass incarceration begins uh, at the end of Reconstruction, during the uh, period of Reconstruction, there's a, a, a what I would call a successful period in which from roughly 1868 to 1874, African Americans uh, controlled their communities. They were the mayors, they were the chiefs of police. They controlled their communities in the South. They were mm -hmm. successful. If you look at the, especially the Gulf states in the South from roughly 60, A69 to 74, 
the legislatures of the South are black majorities. Mm -hmm. And it was a mid-terrorism because the best way to understand the Civil War is that it doesn't begin with Fort Sumner, it doesn't end uh, with Appomattox. It goes from guerrilla warfare to military war, back to guerrilla warfare, paramilitary warfare. If you're African-American or a Union soldier, or Republican on the ground in the, for, in the Confederate States, fighting doesn't stop at the end of uh, mm -hmm. Appomattox. It keeps on going. Go but blacks were able to control their community. The upshot is, for a variety of reasons, uh, so, uh, Union troops left, uh, uh, African Americans were left to their own devices, and one of the ways in which white former Confederates, white Southerners were able to keep African Americans unfree was through convict labor. They passed laws mm -hmm. uh, making it uh, a crime, literally to, to if, you, if you were caught stealing a candy bar for a few pieces of a few mm -hmm. dimes, you get a 20 year sentence or 10 year sentence. Yeah. And uh, Angola uh, was, in fact, it was, that was, it was a site of prison then in, uh, in the largest uh, prison farm uh, at that time was the, uh, became the parchment farm, but it begins as also a plantation in Mississippi. And it started out as convict leasing. So the state was, because of the change in laws that uh, disproportionately penalized uh, African Americans, uh, the, uh, the state prison population was overflowing. And so former planters said, I'll lease prisoners mm -hmm. from the state. The state would pay them yeah. tens of thousands of dollars. And they would say, actually, essentially take them to their old plantation and force them to work with no pay, use the lash. And in some cases, they would then sublease them out to railroad companies. They'd make even more money. Yeah. And the railroad companies would work them to death. In fact, mm -hmm. most slaves had longer lifespans during slavery than convicts did mm -hmm. in the next 50 years in the post-Reconstruction period. And Angola became particularly known for very harsh conditions. Very this, harsh conditions. I mean, this, every this, morning this, in the morning, you got to face that man on the horse. It's not going away. You know, it looked like some people say, do this still exist? Well, in the morning, you better be in that field, else there's consequence. And one of the things that is, one of the many things that's so rich for me, because I'm very interested in the relation between past and present and the way in which how one understands the past influences the present and can shape the future, is the, the photographs, there were photographs of Angola, or what's now Angola in the 19th century of convicts, there are photographs of parchment. I've seen 19th century photographs with a man on a horse with a rifle that mm -hmm. looks very similar um, to this, the difference is that the prison uniforms are different. Yeah. yeah. That's the main difference. That's, it. That's the only difference. You're the clothing right. is really the only difference. Yeah. Yeah. So when did you start going to Angola to make photographs? 1980, we started documenting the prison. And, um, and, and did you do this together? I mean, you, you did together, I mean, but um, did you, you went and got permission, or how did it, how did it start? Well, the first time we went to Angola, we met a French photographer named Bernard Herman, and Bernard was one of the greatest photographers I could ever meet. He was in New Orleans working on, on the color book. And we hooked up, I met him at the camera store one day, I remember we was buying paper. But anyway, Bernard was interested in seeing more Louisiana, so, I, and I told him, I said, well, I want to get in Angola, and he was a French journalist at that time, so we called up and they said, come on up. And then from that time, Bernard had went back to Paris, but it was so many people that I grew up was in Angola. We, you know, people were writing, and Chandra still get a lot of letters every day almost. But can you tell us about this image, Chandra? Who is this? Oh, Dad. Oh, um, this man. His name is on the shirt too. They called him Daddy O, um, and we were there for like a concert or something, but we were able to go around to the different um, camps or several, they allowed us to go to a few camps. I met, I met Daddy-O, and he's, he was an old man. He looked to be about the same age as my grandfather, um, kind of same bodybuilding everything. But I got to talking to him and interviewing him, and he, he said that he had, that was his second time in Angola. 
He said that he had been there the first time for about 15 years or something, and he was released. And he lived in the town of St. Francisville, where Angola is. And when he got released, he said he was home for a few weeks or something, and something happened in the town. And they just came and got him. And they brought him back to jail. And he spent the rest of his life there. But he was 75 when I, when I made that image. And I just... Um, I, I think he's a very strong and handsome looking man, but just to see somebody that old, and I, there were a lot of men that I saw, I just never saw one as old as him. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Keep going. Yes. I think the state wastes a lot of money keeping people in prison 80, 90 years old, because you know, after a certain time, even if you did trouble, a man at a certain time, he don't, you know, life changes you, you know? Oh. Okay, now this is called CCR or lockdown. This is what we call the hole. This is where, um, well, it could be pretty dangerous in there because you don't have much space. It's two men to, I, I think, a four by eight cell. So it, imagine me and you don't get along and we're in this little room here, one of us got to go. <laughs> so you might go to Angola with 10 years, but when you get in that block there, you might wind up with life because you can easily be violated. You going too far? Why went too far? This is these are these are some guys at the Angola rodeo, but um, they're bull riders, so they're waiting. Waiting for the bull. John, yeah. can you tell us a little bit about the what this rodeo is? Yes. Yeah, so there's a actually a long tradition in slavery going back to antiquity, in which um, slaves in antiquity were. Um, were used uh, in arenas and to fight, mm -hmm. uh, and if they won, they received certain in, in classical Greek and classical Rome, they could receive their freedom. But it, uh, in Amer in well, through in slave societies, it was not uncommon to use slaves as a form of entertainment in some sort of. Uh, either a rodeo or some sort of a fight as a uh, for spectator sports for uh, the master class. And mm -hmm. so in many respects, this is a continuation of a long tradition mm -hmm. uh, of uh, enslaved societies. And by slave societies, I mean societies that are defined by slavery. It's not just an economic system, it's an entire cultural system. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, one of the things that so, I think is so resonant about these uh, prison photographs is that uh, in after slavery is legally abolished, mass incarceration, and I referred to the uh, Parchman Farm uh, and, uh, the, uh, and the, what became Angola, that was one of the ways in which white Southerners were able to keep African Americans unfree. In 1890s, in actually 1900, 90% of African Americans remained in the former Confederate states, they were unfree. Mm -hmm. That began to change with the Great Migration, but they mm -hmm. were unfree be either because of being tied to the land through sharecropping or through being convicts in prison and the laws disproportionately affecting African Americans, and especially in uh, Mississippi and Louisiana. Those, those were the two states, states that yeah. were the wealthiest states in the antebellum period because of slavery, and they're the two states that uh, have had the most, the highest number of mass incarceration. Yeah. And when was this image made, Chandra? Truth. Um, this is 2013, actually. Yes. So and in the the 20th century, the the rise of mass incarceration begins in the immediate wake of the Civil Rights Act and the Voting Rights Act of the 1960s. It, it initially begins with Nixon, and I show my students charts mm -hmm. that from uh, Nixon initiates this uh, war on drugs, which is a way to disproportionately. Um, or adversely uh, penalize African Americans uh, because of the war in Vietnam, other factors that he doesn't really launch it. But under Reagan's administration, mm -hmm. the, num the, the number of um, uh, convicts and dis the vast majority of whom are non white, especially African Americans, beginning with Reagan as a proportion of uh, per, uh, numbers of based on a population of 100,000, the graph just goes straight up. In fact, to this, right now, the United States 
there are more prisoners uh, at, based on 100,000 population than anywhere else in the world. Mm -hmm. Russia is second. The two unknowns are China and North Korea. Mm -hmm. But Russia is second. <laughs> in Europe, there are seven times proportionally, there are seven to eight times as many convicts in the United States as that in Europe or our neighbor in the North Canada. Yeah. And so here, what you're saying is kind of reverberation of, it's you know, when you look at these, why this is significant, I mean, this is contemporary America, but these reverberations of these histories. Yes, yes. It's, in fact, one scholar has referred to it as slavery by another name. Mm -hmm. uh, another has called it worse than slavery. Worse than slavery, yeah. I call that who that man on his on that horse. All we know, we call him boss because in Angola, the men used to sing a lot in the morning. You know, they do a little singing still, but at one time, that's what made the work go by. You know, if you ever heard of Lead Belly, yeah. those were the people who worked in these same fields. Hmm. So a lot of time when we go to Angola, that's just music give us the juice because ain't much have changed <coughs> since the time when Lead Belly was there. When you. Because if you don't complete your role on this line, this man will wait to the end of the day and take you back out in that field till you finish that work. So the picture that we just saw with the man on the horse, that was Keith's image in uh, 1980. And I, I have one. I, it may be in this pack. Um, it was in uh, 2004, but it's really not much different. This is one of Keith's images, a portrait. This is Glenn Demorell, guy I grew up with. You know, we live on both sides of the lens, meaning when I go to Angola, some of the same guys that I played marbles with are in those cell blocks. So I don't feel a sense of scariness. Like sometimes the people would say, man, you don't want to go to, to lock down them boys there. And I would say, you know, you call the captain. You say, well, Cap, let me take my chance and see what it's like. But uh, this is so when, one of your shots here. Yeah. yeah, so when when we're there at the rodeo, artists who are incarcerated get to display their works and sell it. So this is one of the artists. Yeah. And I think that his sign, you his know, piece. means forgive those prison officials. Mm. And this man, his name is Lloyd Bone. He usually drives the horse and buggy for any... Um, person incarcerated that has passed. Yeah, he's the buggy man. No. And that's a, a family member, a friend visiting him. And um, wait a minute. Here it is. It's just a, a it's, it's a, a portrait. portrait. Um, it's not any of the damaged images or it's not um, Angola. It's a, a, a kid that's in our neighborhood. And these are some of the images Hurricane. we're about to see that were um, inundated in Hurricane Katrina waters. And this is an image of the Desire Housing Project. Um, the kids are on their way to school, but they used to have fruit trucks out in the morning. They could buy fruit and vegetables. We were, we were talking about this earlier, and it's really fascinating what the, the water does to the images and how it creates new areas of focus, how you see different yeah, in the old days, we would have thrown prints like that away. We would say, oh, that's a bad print, you know? <laughs> and so uh, we had to make, make a lot of adjustments. Yeah. <laughs> but when did you, so you, so you put them in a, in a freezer, mm -hmm. and then what was that like for you to kind of take out your archive and? Well, you know, it was like, <laughs> it was like, Five whole years later, we, we had them in the freezer, and, and we'd open it and look at the bags, and like one day we're going to be able to do something with this. But when we did get the opportunity, Ford Foundation um, gave us a grant to do the restoration work. And it was, you know, at first we like washed slides and negatives and everything slide right off it. Yeah, the, and so we, we were like, well, we can't do that. And so we started scanning all of the slides and all of the negatives. Well, after um, we put them in a the freezer. Yeah. And about how much work is this? Like how, oh my God. how much do you think, how many images do you think this was? We had thousands like of images. Like 30 years of work. We threw away. And 30 years of work. Thanks to the digital, because at that time, 
you know, having, because when we take them out the freezer, still the day I have a freezer full of negatives, I'll be maybe scanning for the next couple of years. Yeah, but still got when we take them out, you have to scan them real quickly, else they're just going to just to nothing. So it was interesting because when we start, you couldn't see them on the slides at first until yeah. you make the print, you know. And it was like when we made a print and we start looking at them and it just took us to another level, you know. Like this is a plantation where we visited called Allendale Plantation, and that was a little girl peeping out the door. No. Out the, I mean, out the side of the house. It's actually the weatherboard missing from their home. And this is, this is one of... Uh, the damage work. The yeah. damage works. I just call it a new, new work. Um, and for a long time, I didn't know what it was. It looked like a cave or something. But if you look closely, it's a gathering of people. Second yeah. Line, yeah. Well, I see the men yeah. right here yeah. and legs right there. Yeah. So I, I call it the gathering. But the way the emotion shifted the greens and all that stuff, you know, we don't have to do any Photoshop or none of that business to the image. You just <laughs> put it in the scanner and it's beautiful, this you know? Incredible. That's another one. Too. That's the Trimmy Community Center. He is waiting to swim. And this is called the shop. This is actually a picture of all of our New Orleans jazz greats that we got now. They were kids back then. Yeah, the Rebirth Brass um, Band. We've too. Got, um, oh, we've got Corey Henry. He's the leader of the uh, New Birth, but he's now Corey Henry in the Funkettes. You've got Philip Frazier, the leader of the Rebirth Brass Band. The late Tuba Fats on, on uh, the tuba. Dr. Mike This White. man in the white. Tuxedo is the late Jesse Hill. Ooh, poop a doo. Y'all ever heard that song? <laughs> Young people don't know about it. Well, there are yeah. lots of people in the audience. Uh, and this is, he's dancing with his daughter. There's Dr. Michael White up there. He's a famous yeah. clarinetist in New Orleans as well. well. It's, it's and an array of other musicians. Yeah, it's interesting to hear your references because, of course, in the 1930s, Alan Lomax and all these folks were down there recording as a part of... Um, uh, not the farm security, but it was one of those federal programs. Yeah. Um, yeah the, the, WP Works Progress yeah, Administration works progress the um, to part. record Farms this, this, these, these voices. Yes. Yes. Mm -hmm. yes. Yeah. And each state also during the period it was both photographically and each state also had a book that that documented the history, especially of the southern states. Yeah. So, so yeah, it's it's I, I, these are incredibly rich. Okay. I'm going the right way. This is just, what did I do? Mm -mm. There you go. Move. Yeah, well, whatever you did, you move whatever happened on the list. Am I pressing it hard enough? I'm sorry. Oh, that's it. Oh, that is. Okay. Oh, yeah, that's right, because we didn't want to leave you guys with that Angola burden. <laughs> and so we wanted to show you some other things. <laughs> and there were more that I was going to put on there, but. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. But, um, okay. Well, uh, perhaps we can uh, so, open. Do, do you want to? No, no, no. I was. Okay. Uh, perhaps we can um, open up for some discussion then. If yeah. Folks have some questions and comments. Yes, in the back. So why, why, why did they let you take photographs in Angola? Maybe well, how that happened? Angola, you know, we established a relationship with the guys that working in Angola at one time. Um, even though you hear a lot of negative things about Angola, but there were people in the prison that we worked with, uh, Norris Henderson, who, what you call a jailhouse lawyer, but he sent like a thousand guys out to prison, and Gary Tyler, you know, we work with some people who were really involved in the arts in the prison. You know, Angola, one thing, you got a lot of very skilled people in there. So we was able to build a relationship. Like now, we still go to Angola and, you know, I mean, we got friends up there that we help send stuff to. And um, So after you start documenting, it's just like when we go on the River Road, like if I go up to uh, St. James Parish, I still can go back to the old churches and still, like right now, there's a church with the river baptism, girls by the river, 
Well, that church floated all the way across the river. So the, the pastor glad that we have those images. So now we're doing AR photography. So now I'll be able to go there and place some of them images on that landmark. So, you know, it's something you establish a relationship. It's just hard to just go there and shoot and walk away. So we still go and work with the people there. So it's and interesting, the, the kind of evolving function of your images that at one point you were documenting to save, and then now, because of Katrina, you're, you're serving this kind of dispersed community. Yeah, it becomes. Well. And the community has experienced loss. But go ahead, Chandra. I was just going to add to what Keith was saying about um, building relationships. A lot of the, the guys, like, there are at least five or six guys that had more than 27 years in Angola that are out now, but while they were in there, we communicated with them and we were friends with them. And these guys are heavyweights. They're policy changers. They changed the prison. You know, mm. Gary Tyler um, the started the theater drama group in Angola. Mm. And, and he had so much respect from the authorities. He was allowed to take the drama club out to schools, to universities, and places yeah. to do the plays. Um, they had so much faith and trust in him that he said, you know, I need women in my play. I can't keep using these men as women. We're not going to do it but if we do it like that. He said, get me some women from the Louisiana Correctional Facility. I need to be able to look at some. And they did that for him. There's a, there's a play on YouTube, it's called The Passion Play. It's directed by Gary Tyler. Hmm. He's all over YouTube. He did 42 years. He is 61 years old, um, was wrongfully incarcerated, but he's been, um, he, he's been out now for three years. Mm -hmm. But all these men are some amazing Calvin. people. They have like more humility than I can even explain. So to think that they did all of this, if you heard them talk, you wouldn't be able to do anything but embrace them and love them. For One guy we work with, Calvin Duncans, who just graduated after spending um, 27 years in Angola. He came and went to Tulane to get a book, and while he was there, he checked in there, and he just graduated yes, with a law graduated. degree from Tulane University. Mm -hmm. And he also helped change a lot of the policies that's dealing with uh, debt. You know, he was on death row and he, he sent a lot of guys home. So I think our involvement with some of these guys that we was fortunate to meet, Calvin Duncan, Norris Henderson, who now sits on the pardon board in Angola, Norris Henderson, you know. Even Wilbur Rito. We, Wilbur Rito was the editor of the Angolite magazine. The Angola Three, you know, the, they were the Black Panthers in the prison. All those guys lived on, where well, you see the guys, two in the cell block, well that's where Albert Woodfox spent 46 years right there in that, in that cell block. Mm -hmm. so, um, so it's like we built a relationship, what I'm saying, after you get in, it's hard just to walk away, you know, like this work, our work belongs to those guys, to me, you know, whatever I do in my community, I've been blessed, because I could be behind them same bars, you know, because those are the same people I play with, so uh, our work, I feel, it's to, to, for, to speak for those guys, because a lot of people don't believe, you know, they see the picture, they think that's like, eight. when we bring these pictures to the school, uh, kids don't believe that this in this time, you know, till they get to Angola, you know, so we tell them about choices you make determine your fate, because a lot of these kids in the inner city, they're not going to go to the museums, they're not seeing exhibits, like we have a little community of to be exposed to place it. in our neighborhood that we created an art space where we teach kids framing, matting, but also we get them involved in putting together shows because it's, it's gonna be important to bring, now schools are not introducing kids to arts like when I went to school, you had photography, brick mace, you just had skills, you know? All is not fortunate to get to Harvard here, so <laughs> it's like, but if you, know, like, if you know how to work or lay bricks, you can always get a job, so. You know, we now we are partnering with some of the same guys from Angola, because a lot of those guys in Angola, you come out with a skill. You know, you you develop something there. You know, like Norris Henderson, they was, the inmates was gonna burn the prison down, and Norris said, No, if we burn it down, you think we living bad now? 
where you think we're going to be if we burn it down? So now it's not suing the prison. That's why you see people of color in Angola, women on the horse. For uh, better conditions. You, the handicap, he changed the whole prison, these guys, you know. So it's not like a lot of those guys were just playing checkers. We were able to get involved with people who were there to change some of the conditions there. So it we helped. also kind of like, um, you, you know, became pen pals with, like we were pen pals with the lifers, um, Melvin Tyler, who, yeah. who um, they had a, a, a club or something. The lifers had a club. And so okay. they would invite us to events and things that they yeah. did. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Did you answer one? Why would the officials? Now, say it again. What was the response of the officials? Like, were they, they would see these images? And I don't, I don't even think the people, you got to understand Angola is a world in its own. If you grew up in a rural parish and all your life, like they got an area in Angola called B land. And that's where the free people live. But to some of them guys, that's normal to grow up seeing men in the field. They don't see these pictures as no threat. Now, some of the pictures I got, I was fortunate because I didn't go there as a gawking tourist photographer. I went and I kept going back. So they're not gonna let you see certain parts of Angola. You're not gonna go there and go get in a hole. It took people like the guys in the inside telling me, man, look, try to get to, to lockdown, but it's not like you're gonna go there every day. But to get any subject, to me, you have to work it. You can't just always go there. Sometimes, you know, you have to go more, more than one to get, to get the feeling of what it's like. Because we want to show more important, this work is great to be in museums and stuff, but the children in our community, we are trying to let them see this is what, this is, this is, this is reality right now, you know. Well, also speaking about the, the space, I mean, the people who work there, a lot of them live there on the site and they live for generations. Their yeah. parents work there, they work there, and it's, it is a world unto itself. Um, it's a whole world that Angola has its own life force. You have six, seven thousand inmates, you have. Imagine this whole town, not just Angola, we document all the small private owned prison right now, which they got guys which they can get to Angola. Like if you're in Cotton Pole Prison, it's private owned. And you're not going to see your people, at least in Angola, you can get visits with your family. But a private-owned prison? Well, private-owned prison answers to themselves. Like, it's who, like, who do they? yeah, it's a cooperation. So if we have 500 beds, you think I want to, these guys to go home if my whole town now, the cell parish? Check it out. Those people, town, depending on, the thing is, that's why we calling it um, slavery, the prison industrial complex, because if they didn't have crime going on, no, like every morning, the sheriffs get together and barter. Like if you got two guys, one guy, two plumbers, I'm over in the cell parish, I got two carpenters, we bartering every morning. Like, well, you send me that boy over here. Wow. So at the end of the week, like if we go and hunting, I can take my boys home with me. If I want out and camp built, I can bring them boys anywhere I go, I check them out and they come and do my work. So a lot of these guys in the rural parish, they never, went to school, some of them might have third grade education, but by their family working at the prison, you become a sergeant, a lieutenant, yeah, yeah. You, you go up in the ranks. So a lot of the guys, like Gary Tyler, for instance, the ward nine Angola was 19 years old when he started, and Gary was 16 years old when he went on dead road. Right. So the ward and Gary pretty much grew up together, you see? Yeah. So when Gary, so it's like those type of relationships. When you go to Angola, for instance, you're gonna be there. They want you from 20 to life. They're not, they're not taking you five years. They want you for the long haul because that crop- it's your body. You're not gonna see tractors. You're not gonna see hardly no machine. You're gonna see that man on that horse in the morning telling you, either you get it or you get your husband because he want that field grind. So it's not like a place where um, people have an opportunity, you have a choice, they're like, oh, I don't want to work in the field. Well, if you don't work in that man field, don't expect, to, you know, you're going to be in that hole. So yeah, that's the, take yeah. That. Another connection with uh, slavery, Frederick Douglass in his second autobiography, My Bondage and My Freedom, the best-selling one, 
said, describe the slave, the plantation in exactly the same language you just described, Angola. It's a world unto itself. It yeah. is. And then he detailed it. Now, unfortunately, the kids in the inner city is, is to, you know, they need them bodies right now because, like I say, if you go to that rodeo, the credit union, the whole town depends on that prison population. That's why if you get, there's a book out by Albert Woodfock called Solitary. If y'all get it, get it, because he spent 46 years in the same cell block. And uh, even now, when he sits, he sits with his hands like that because he was shackled so long. So when we first saw him and um, got a chance to talk to him, um, Gary Tyler was with us and Gary said, man, man, how you been doing? He said, so, so what, I think he said something like, so um, what, what are you doing, what you been doing or something like that? And he said, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my hands. You know, because just because it was a habit, it wasn't a habit you, because he was oh, always shackle, yeah. um, um, handcuffed. Mm -hmm. So if he sits, he'll sit with his hands like this, yeah. or you know, his, like that. So that was just that was really a uh, prominent thing for me to hear him say. You know, I'm, I'm trying to figure out what to do with my hands because you, we can't even imagine the effects that prison have on people. We know guys who, you know, came home and they're you know, they go through the house and they're doing different things and the wife will say, honey, you need to turn the lights off. And, and so it gets to the point where, honey, I keep telling you, why don't you turn off the lights? And they'll say, well, baby, for 30 years, I didn't have control of the television. I didn't have control of the lights. Right. <laughs> I didn't control anything. Yeah. I was, you know, so I'm getting there, but, but I'm just, I just use that example to say that yeah. There's so many different effects that, you know, they have to deal with and, and you know, get into really the world, change. into reality, you know, out here. It takes a lot. Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, well. Uh, thank you. Um, the work is um, wonderful. Um, I just have a question in terms of um, the, the, the idea of, uh, security or if you've ever been censored in terms of um, trying to make the work? Like, what did you have any security? Um, I mean, the work is, you know, um, um, there's a certain dignity to the, the, mm -hmm. the way that you are photographing, um, you know. Um, but but is, was there any, like, uh, security or any, like, uh, censorship at, at least at the very beginning of the project? Are you talking about the prison? Yes. Yeah, go I don't think we, you know, when we first started, now you got a lot of photographers. And, uh, but at that time, when I first started going to Angola, the warden, I mean, that's just life. They don't even see, you know, the hardship like we see it there. You know, like, that's everyday life to have a hundred men on the line, they can walk you up to five or 10 miles in the field. But I don't think that um, they feel, you know, I mean, I, with, with us going, you know, it never was no problem. And then we- I don't always, either, but I think the censorship for them, because they, 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 they agree and they let you come in. The censorship for them is not to bring you where they don't want to bring you. So wherever you saw, that's where we yeah. might have asked to go and they brought us. But they have the right not to bring you Most of the time they'll bring you to the to mechanic shop you know or to saying? the model, or the show the model prisoners. But that's what I'm saying. When we work with the guys that we got involved with, they was able to show us where to get at to show really what the field. Else I would have just had pictures of the guys working in a mechanic shop or at the, uh, you know, craft shop, but for us being, we wanted to get in, you know, even with Aaron Neville, for instance, when we go with Aaron Neville, who's, who is loved by the warden in Angola, you know, so it's like, uh, you know, the, it's not like a welcome committee, but they don't feel it's threatened to come in and document, but at the same time, you have to have the vision on the way you want to go. Else. And they do have rules. Yeah. They yeah. have rules, and you got to follow their rules. I mean, I've been told, don't point my camera, don't point your camera at me. 
you know? Yeah, like and the like, men, okay. they don't like to be photographed. Yeah. Yeah. And that, that's, I mean, you just have, you have to. Well, yeah. it's, it's by, interesting by listening to you and t- saying that, you know, it's a world. I mean, even the phrases that you use, the free men. Yeah, that's how they consider. It's that's like, just, language. just your language the is. The whole language is. So remnant, is so resonant with slavery. Slavery, yeah. Yeah, just to think of men like goose picking. I never heard about goose picking, right? That mean if the man on that horse tell you goose picking, that mean he wants you to get on the ground and pull it. Pull like they want to see nothing, but, like dirt. You know, yeah, you're picking those, yeah. I don't know, like a weed eater would do. That's what you do with your hands. And it was brutal. Another thing, we can talk about the men, but women are suffering way more than men in prison. And there's way more women. It's not, a, I mean, I'm glad that's what we're trying to move now to work on the women because since St. Gabriel Prison, which was like the maximum security for women, it flooded. So they took all these women now and they spread, spread them across the whole state of Louisiana. So if you're a family, it, you are way up in Monroe, uh, East Carroll Parish, it's going to take you six, seven hours to leave from New Orleans to go see your family. Mm. So it's much harder for the women than me, I think, right you now. Know, you know, like in Angola, you, you can literally visit your loved ones, touch them. But in the, in the private prisons, yeah, it's, different. it's all video. You don't get to, you, don't, you know, you don't get that. It's like video, you talk to them like that. So you, oh, you uh, talked about that, an elderly man, you said he had been released for a short time into the community, and then there was some trouble. You know, was it like he was almost being targeted to come that's back? A, that's that's whether, what that was whether he to me. was involved or not, but that's just kind of what happened? I mean, is yes. it? Some and, small towns. Yeah. I got the feeling, too, you know, like, um, the town that he lived in, you know, they may have had a kangaroo court. I, you mm. know what that is? It's like, it's a jacked up court where you're gonna be guilty no matter what. I don't know what it was like, Mm -hmm. but when he talked to me, he said they came and got me. And he said, I didn't do it. I didn't do whatever they said like Mm -hmm. that. So I I mean, I- But but he's out on parole and so he doesn't have a lot of power. He doesn't have a lot of power. I got the the impression that he may not have had a lot of education, a lot of money to help his situation, exactly. all right. of those They got people right now can come out of Angola, but they don't have an address to come to, so they're gonna stay there. They might be 70 years old, 80 years old. If you don't have an address to be released to right now, you, mm-hmm. you gonna, gonna, and then some guys, imagine if you be gone so long, like even mm-hmm. Gary Tyler, who is real, educated himself in the prison. He's living out in Los Angeles right now in Pasadena, and he told me, he said, Keith, if I didn't have all the support of all y'all people, I'll walk back to Angola. Because mm-hmm. now I'm paying light bill. I never had to pay, uh, no. You don't know how to do all so this. So he said he went to the store and, and he wind up buying sardines and crackers because, you know, real jesting. So a lot of people, now in the way New Orleans, especially in the Ninth Ward, where you had a lot of family on property, people don't have nowhere to go. So now you got families like just displaced. So a lot of these guys, it's gonna be hard for them really to adjust if we don't, you know, like not like Norris Henderson, he have now a re-entry program because a lot of the guys are carpenters and stuff and teaching them. But a lot of times, family was everything, you know, and now in New Orleans, with the way things are going uh, with gentrification, we'll never have the, the foothold of the city no more because people are not, like when I grew up in the lower nine well, my daddy came from sharecropping, but he bought a, a lot at 21 years old and built a house, and that's all I remember that house. Mm-hmm. But a lot of things didn't change now. So a lot of these people don't understand. Today, New Orleans is not the same New Orleans what it used to be because people are coming away taking advantage of, of the, the disaster, you see. Mm-hmm. You also mentioned a man who um, went to Tulane, got out of prison, and so that sounds like he maybe had some opportunities in prison to educate himself, or how did, how did yeah, that Yeah, Calvin Duncan's, if you Google him, Calvin Duncan's came home, well, again, Norris lived 
in, in Angola, one thing they have, they have a law library. And I think for, that, Norris Henderson did 27 years, but he spent 21 years in that library. Mm-hmm. We was with judge, the judge, and the judge who freed Norris said, when well, we didn't know it, we called in gold and get it from Norris. Because um, they, while they was running around in school, Norris and them was in the prison studying law. So even now, to see this guy Norris, the relationship he had with the warden, and the people that he, you know, to walk. It's on the Louisiana pardon board. He can walk in Angola right now and the warden would say, we bought the gun foundation and, and the warden came around and said, y'all come in with your cameras, whatever the you want. The Social Justice uh, Foundation. Right. It was a group of people, maybe 40 people. Yeah, that's the respect were, they have for were allowed to bring, And they did a tour of the prison. Hmm. One thing I'll find I'll, out. We've got time for one more oh. question. Oh, I'm sorry, I'm going on too much. He's had his hand up for a while, too. Well, thank you. I had the great play. I was in the airport, uh, Armstrong Airport in New Orleans, and um, I saw this man walking by himself in the terminal, and it was Albert Woodfox. And I'm not, I don't remember, one of the uh, Angola Three, and I I don't remember how I recognized him, except he had this amazing presence that was just, just this amazing, and I went up to him, and we talked, and... And then I walked over to the gate where I was waiting for a flight, and this woman said, who was that man? And, you know, wow. so he had an amazing, he was on his way to Los Angeles, maybe a, a, a yeah. visit arranged by uh, maybe Mr. Tyler. Yeah. Um, I also think somebody should call out the fact that there's a campaign underway at Harvard to get the university to divest from prisons. And so just encourage people to give some attention to that. But I, here's a question for you. I know I have friends who do photography in New Orleans and who have worked with various people, UNO, and had some really nicely done books published. Mm-hmm. And I wonder if, if you could talk about have you had any books published or are you working on having any books of your photography uh, published? And got to see the book location. what's going on with that, please? Yeah, there's a lovely publication called Louisiana Medley. Their so, exhibition has been traveling yeah. and has received great attention. Um, so oh, there is you. a book. It's called Louisiana Medley. One book, yeah. I think yeah, here's a uh, Yep. I have the essay. And, uh, so there is a wonderful yeah, book. Louisiana Medley. And we were honored with Makeda Best doing the introduction to the prison industrial complex, which is in this book. Yeah, but it's a, it's um, a book of Some probably of more than a hundred images, but it's of a lot of the different themes across the board. Several pictures of each thing. Thank you. Um, it is on Amazon. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, it is. Amazon.com. Maybe. Yeah. yeah. I, I was wondering, I didn't know if you all had it here. It, it should be at the Coop still, yeah. I mean, they don't have that many copies, but. Yeah, you can go online. The Fog? Yeah, yeah. The uh, Museum. Oh, The Fog, it should be, at, yeah, I think it's at the <coughs> Fine Arts Library. Um, we donated one there, and um, the Coop should have a few. Yeah, thank you. We got one more question. Um, I was wondering, uh, do you see your work more in a um, positive light because you can talk to people and maybe do some good and also for you as a positive experience or does it make you more like sad? So what we see it in a what? Is, is it positive for you? It, it seems like it's a, on the one hand you're, you're, you're revealing all of this. But I think it's, it's, I think it's, it's a positive thing. I mean, we may be photographing a negative thing. Um, But to me, by exposing and bringing it to the forefront, especially people who have no idea about this, I I think that's that's activism and that's, Mm. you know. That's the power of helping to tell the story. And you know, there are many of you guys in the audience, who knows what your niche is, you might have some passion that you want to contribute to criminal justice reform or something. So, you know, it's just really a tool to educate people and um, make you more aware. Yeah, we feel that the work is, is to me, it's positive because we show in a part of life, especially like me and Sean, we probably the first African-Americans to go into maximum security right. prison yeah. and have 
privilege to go in there and work and shoot. Mm -hmm. To me, I, I wasn't working for the New York Times or no publication. I just know that if I get the opportunity, it's just like when we go on the back road, like we just go shoot from our heart because it's more than just like, like a lot of photographers say, well, how much money you make? Well, a lot of things you do, it's not about money. It's about, having, you know, when I go out and shoot on the back road and I meet the people on the cane, Chandra will sometimes stop at the thrift store and bring clothes. So we get to help give back. The work brings us into communities normally that, you know, people ask, man, why you want, like when I was doing the women in the field, it, was, it would be daybreak, they would say, ah, what you want to take a picture of me this time of morning with my hair? And I said, well, when you dress up Sunday at church, I'll come get you again. And she said, okay. But imagine in the morning, how many of us want to be photographed daybreak in the morning? You know? So I'm honored that I can get the lady, like with Shonda shot Gail Dorsey and captured the dignity. If you see, the, the, the thing with our pictures, we try to bring the dignity out. No matter what you are, you could be whatever, we're going to try to capture that in the light. And I think that's the beauty of the type of photography we do. You know, we're not um, like artists, you know, who we've been fortunate to stay together and struggle. I, I am blessed to help Shauna because when you have a passion for something, it's, it's hard to find other people to have that interest, you know. And that's why Shauna became, because I shot a lot of beautiful young ladies, but Shauna, she was beautiful, but she knew how to make them prints, and that's. <laughs> <laughs> that was the light of my life, so, you know, so I think we're doing something positive. Yeah. Thank you. But I'm just saying, you know. I don't Thank you. You start off real good, huh? Yeah. Yeah. No, I don't mean to get too caught up because I'm a lady. Okay. Thank you. Thank, thank you, Chandra you. and Keith and John, and thank you all. Thank you.